Okay, let's look at this. So we're going to look at the cathode ray experiment, why it's important to chemistry. Now, one of the important things to understand is that this being done 120 plus years ago was done in a time when knowledge of what's inside of an atom is not like it is now. So we now know about the protons and the neutrons and the electrons and all the things that are inside of an atom and like the nucleus and protons and neutrons in the nucleus and the electrons on the outside. But this was not known at the time. All they knew is that atoms are really small and what everything seemed to be made out of. So the question became, how do you find out what's inside of an atom? And that's where this came in. So um, this guy, J.J. Thompson, had the idea that basically if you can split open an atom and get stuff from outside of, from the inside of it to come out, you can find out what an atom is made of. And so that's the idea of this. Using high voltage electricity, you can basically bust parts of the atom out so that you can see them and detect their properties. And so that's what this was all about. So what it is, is um, this, this cathode ray tube is so called because it has this cathode and it's got this ray coming out of it. Um, what that ray is, is particles that were deflected by charged plates when those plates were placed on the outside. If it, it came out of here and it went toward here, if an object was placed here, it would block the particles. This cribbit was made of particles and not waves. Um, another visualization of this can be seen, uh, let's see, here. When they would turn off the electricity, the ray would disappear. When they would turn the electricity on, the ray would appear. Now, I'm going to change the setting right here. In the absence of an electrical charge on the outside, the ray would just go straight. The particles would come out and just go right to the end. And the presence of a charge, the, the particles would be deflected. So what I'm doing here is I'm increasing the strength of the positive charge here. We'll notice the ray is deflecting toward the positive charge. If we switch the charges, make this positive and this negative, like so, we notice the opposite effect, where now the ray goes toward the other end, which is now positive, and away from this negative end. What this showed is that whatever this is composed of, it's clearly composed of negatively charged particles, because we know that opposites attract in terms of electrical charges. Thus, if it's being attracted toward the positive plate, it must be composed of negatively charged particles. So that was the explanation for what it must be. Now, he did some other things with it. Now, I'm changing the view right here to kind of make clear what I'm about to explain. So I've, if you could zoom in on that ray, you'll find that ray of light is made of particles, high-speed, negatively charged particles coming out of this little slit and going down through the tube. I've turned off the electrical charge, so they're going straight. He did tests to compare things like the, the charge to mass ratio and such. And he came out with test results that showed that these particles were less than one one thousandth the mass of an atom. So they were far smaller than any atom. And they were consistently negatively charged. And no matter what he tested, everything, um, whether it be in this case they give the options of like silver or gold or iron, produced the same particles with the same mass to charge ratio, same properties, same behavior. And because of that, he was able to conclude, and it's not just those three elements, by the way, anything tested gave the same results. It told him that whatever these negatively charged things are, everything has them. And what's more, because they behave the same no matter what they came from, all of these different elements he was testing had the same kind of charged particle in it. They were all behaving the same way. So that meant that the negatively charged particles you find coming out of one element are exactly the same as coming out of another element. They were universal and found everywhere across the periodic table. So that led him to a couple of conclusions. One, since everything contains these, they must be a fundamental part of what makes an atom. Two, this couldn't be the only thing inside of an atom. And that's where, as we bring up a picture of it, his plum pudding model came into, came into account. So named after the British dessert, 
where you have pudding, we would call, we would Americans would call it bread, and plums spread out inside of it. And the idea was, that, okay, he said, clearly there's this negative stuff. I'm going to say there's negatively stuff, negatively charged stuff spread around the inside of an atom like the plums and pudding. But he had to take that a step further. Why is it called the plum pudding model? Well, aside from looking like that, what's this other stuff? The pudding, or like the bread part of it, I guess you could say. He said, well, if there's negatively charged stuff, we know, it's been proven, that atoms are neutral. That means atoms have no charge. Therefore, in order to balance out, there must be positive charge inside of an atom. He didn't know what it was. He had no idea protons existed. He didn't even know what these negative things are called. We call them electrons. The word electron hadn't been invented yet. He called them corpuscles, which is like a word that basically means little lumps of stuff. Negatively charged corpuscles. Um, but anyway, these the negative charges and positive charges he imagined being spread out evenly throughout the, the space of the atom. And so he basically called it negatively charged electrons, or at least our words are electrons, with a spherical cloud of positive charge. Again, because atoms are neutral, there had to be a roughly equal number of pluses and minuses inside to balance it out. So he, re he reckoned that he'd proven with the cathode ray that this negative stuff was there, therefore this must be some other undetectable positive stuff. And that's the origin of the plum pudding model as made possible by the cathode ray experiment.